past 15 years, <laughs> tremendous advances have been made in intracardi in cardiac surgery. However, there's remained one barrier which has made, been most frustrating to those surgeons interested in this aspect of surgical treatment, and that was our inability to work within the heart in a relatively leisurely fashion with the heart open and free of blood. In the saga of the University of Minnesota's quest to make open heart surgery humanly possible and successful, two historic dates stand out. September 2nd, 1952. A university team led by Dr. F. John Lewis, including first assistant Dr. Richard Varco and second assistants Dr. C. Walton Lillehei and Dr. Mansur Tofik used hypothermia to gain access for just over five minutes to the damaged heart of Jackie Johnson, a five-year-old girl who grew up to have children of her own. March 26, 1954, a university team led by Dr. C. Walton Lillehei was the first to employ cross-circulation to temporarily take over the functions of 13-month-old Gregory Glidden's heart long enough to repair it. His large ventricular defect was completely repaired, but tragically he died 11 days later of pneumonia. One brave northern Minnesota mother, Margaret Soikonen, has two different dates embedded forever in her heart. The first is November 1st, 1951, when she gave birth to her first child, Daryl Cootsey. When Daryl was born, she was not allowed to see or touch him at first. She was told in grave, hurried tones that there was something wrong and that because she had the sniffles, she had to stay away from him. Only the nurses could have contact. But Margaret knew she wasn't ill and insisted on learning what was going on. It was not until Christmas that she was able to care for her firstborn at home, but only for a brief two weeks. The second is April 22, 1952, when that tiny son, only 11 pounds at nearly six months of age, died during one of the earliest heart operations at the university's newly opened Variety Club Heart Hospital. Between those two dates, Darrell's entire lifetime passed before his mother's anxious eyes. The doctors at the Hibbing Hospital had said that they wouldn't be able to take care of my son the way he should be taken care of. And they got in touch with the doctors at the university. They didn't give us really much to look forward to, but said they would do the best that they could. And we spent a lot of time going back and forth. After the surgery, two doctors came out and explained to us that he did not survive. So they asked us if uh, we would give them permission to do an autopsy that it would be beneficial to other families who would have to go through the same thing. Darrell's legacy helped ensure a happy ending for hundreds of babies and young children who came after him. His heart was beyond repair by anyone in the spring of 1952. But by fall of that same year, beginning with Dr. Lewis's World First in September, and then beginning anew with Dr. Lillehei's cross-circulation first in March 1954, the road was paved to fix even complex congenital heart problems like Darrell's. And once Dr. Richard DeWall developed his revolutionary heart lung machine, a deceptively simple bubble oxygenator, open heart surgery truly spread worldwide. Margaret's words, 53 years later, are a remarkable message of strength. From one mother with a hole in her heart that can never be repaired, to all of the patients with holes in their heart that, unlike Darrell's, now can be repaired routinely. We wanted to 
uh, other families to be able to have the knowledge that they acquired from that surgery. And with each little bit of knowledge, the advancement meant something more for somebody else. And we didn't feel that that was a time to be selfish. At the University of Minnesota, the development of life-saving procedures and innovative technology continues. From valve replacements, to pacemakers, to implantable left ventricular assist devices, to heart transplants, to robotics, to stem cells, to gene therapy. The university has never stopped making cardiovascular history. One patient, one mother at a time. Though the fiercely fought battle for Darrell's life was lost, he lives on in the thousands of patients who now thrive after cardiovascular surgery at the University of Minnesota and throughout the world.